Hello, I'm Bob Bressler from Sun Microsystems. Today I'm going to talk to you about high bandwidth networking and how it is evolving. This is an area that's creating a great deal of excitement. We'll be taking a look at some of the new things that are now possible. First, I'll talk about the importance of bandwidth and why people are installing high-speed networks. Next, I'll cover some of the implications that this has on network applications and platforms. And finally, we'll take a look at the enabling technologies that allow us to build these high-speed networks. One of the key messages is that we're in the middle of a revolution. It is a bandwidth revolution. The availability of bandwidth is changing dramatically the way we build networks and the way we use them. If we look back over the last decade at what happened with computers on our desktop, we see that the amount of CPU power has gone up by almost two orders of magnitude. Ten years ago, it wasn't unusual to have a desktop machine that had one MIP of performance, while today, many desktops have over 100 MIPs of performance. But in all that time, while desktops got more and more powerful, the amount of bandwidth available for interconnecting desktops and servers has pretty much stayed the same. Although a few places have installed high-speed networks, for the most part, Ethernet has been the common connectivity for networking. And Ethernet, which was invented in the early 1970s, hasn't changed. It continues to be a 10 megabit per second shared environment, which is just now changing, and while networks have stayed constant at 10 megabits per second, the number of users has gone up and the amount of data we're sending over the network has gone up with the net result that each individual user is actually getting less available bandwidth. However, with new technologies like switched Ethernet, switch token ring, and ATM, the same systems can now be interconnected with much higher effective speeds. Wide area networks are also getting much higher capacities. The result is that the amount of network bandwidth each person sees is going up dramatically. In fact, over the next 10 years, it's likely to be at least two orders of magnitude, if not more. On a shared Ethernet segment today, a user is able to get about a half a megabit of throughput. Fast Ethernet at 100 megabits per second is 200 times that. 622 megabit ATM is 1,200 times that. One of the most often asked questions, aside from, of course, is an ATM a cash machine, is what is the good of all this bandwidth? What are the applications that are coming along and filling this bandwidth? Well, there are many. One that's very visible to a user of workstations is viewing multimedia images. Remember the old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words? That means, of course, that you can create a message more clearly for the user than by spelling it out in words. Now actually, I suppose, with a workstation with a million pixels on the screen in 24-bit color, it's likely that a picture is really worth 750,000 words, but we shouldn't quibble. In any case, we're seeing documents being passed around containing pictures as well as descriptions. Graphics are easy to insert, and many applications now let you deal with picture objects as well as graphical objects in a simple way to create multimedia documents that the recipient finds easier to read. A second important aspect is that our workload on these networks tends to be bursty in nature and the peak requirements tend to be far greater than the average. In fact, in many companies where accounting and transaction systems are running, the peaks can be quite exaggerated, and so for mission-critical applications to complete in a timely fashion, a great deal of bandwidth needs to be available to move data across the network. Thirdly, if you're performing a task which is using data from elsewhere on the network, whether it's on a server or in a corporate database, tasks will complete more quickly if the information can be brought to the desktop in a shorter time. A high-speed network will enable us to make different trade-offs on where we keep data. In systems today, since the average bandwidth you can get over an Ethernet 
is on the order of half a megabit per second. If you're doing a computation which requires a lot of information that's kept on the network server, then in order to complete that task more quickly, you're likely to download the whole file onto your local disk where access to the information is two to three megabytes per second. That way your application will run faster. But if you're connected to a server by fast ethernet, which is 100 megabits per second, you could access that data at a full 10 megabytes per second. That's four to five times as fast as your local disk. About the same increase in performance as a local disk over the network disk in a shared environment. And if you're using 155 megabit ATM, that's 15 megabytes a second. Network design trade-offs will be different. Imagine saying, I need to do this compile quickly, so I'm going to move the data onto the network rather than having it on my desktop. In that example, the trade-off works because disk manufacturers are focusing today on increasing the storage capacity of a disk rather than the transfer rate. Since manufacturers tend to put one disk drive in your PC, the most important thing is how large is the disk rather than how fast is that disk. If you have a network server which is serving many users, that server can easily have multiple disk drives and you can stripe the data across those disk drives. That allows you to read the data at a much faster rate which new high-speed networks can easily keep up with. Naturally, as CPUs and the desktop get faster, the need for getting more information quickly continues to escalate. And finally, there's the natural human tendency to want to get things done as quickly as possible. It's very annoying to watch a picture paint across the screen. You'd like it to pop right up onto the screen. One of the big changes we will see is the role that desktops will play. Traditionally, they played the role of bringing information in from various sources and processing them, running applications on that information. However, a new model is emerging in the business environment where there's constant pressure to improve productivity and efficiency. The more information that we have about the way our business is running, the better we become at working effectively. Mosaic and the World Wide Web have shown people how easy it is to look at information from all over the company on a real-time basis. Checking out information on one server, checking backup details on another server, with easy links between them. We are finding that the desktop is evolving from a model of simply processing information to one which also uses the computer as a window, if you will, for viewing information. It becomes your tool for accessing information from all over the network. In fact, networking technologies such as ATM provide a virtual fire hose for bringing the information onto the desktop. So, as the desktop machines mature, they will need to evolve to both be able to drink from this fire hose as well as present the information to the user in a way that's easy to understand and easy to view. Not only are workstations changing as a result of high-speed networking, but so are server-based applications. When we lived in an environment with a congested, shared Ethernet, the number of applications that you wanted to put on one server was high because adding more servers only increased the contention and thus decreased the available bandwidth. However, as network bandwidth increases, whether it's through switched Ethernet, ATM, or whatever technology, then you'll be able to put lots of different servers on the network without degrading the performance. Recognizing this, companies are beginning to build specialized servers, or appliances as they're beginning to be called, which really are tailored to do one job particularly well. Whether it's handling mosaic pages or file systems, or whether it's just handling a particular application a device which is dedicated to doing that one thing very well can be built very cost effectively. And that's all the result of having enough network bandwidth. Some applications that are changing with the availability of high bandwidth are those that involve video. If we take a look at video teleconferencing, 
these applications have been slow to deploy in the enterprise, usually as a result of congested networks. Video takes a fair amount of bandwidth on the network, and if the network is reasonably full with other traffic, the video will either bring the entire network to its knees, or it will simply look bad. In any case, it will not be popular to use, but that's now changing. If we look at desktop video teleconferencing, one of the key issues is delay. By that I mean there is a long delay between when I say something and when you hear it coming out your end. By the time you answer me, I will have continued to speak and you'll be stepping all over my words. It's generally unpleasant. Anyone who has used the video teleconference with a satellite delay has certainly experienced this. In fact, there have been several studies done by some of the wide area teleconferencing suppliers which have shown that if you graph how happy you are with video teleconferencing versus the delay between one speaker speaks and when he is heard at the other end, there is a very sharp knee in the curve. There's some debate exactly where the knee is, but it tends to be in the 150 to 200 millisecond range. And there is general consensus that when it's much longer than that, it's simply too unpleasant to use. If it's better than that, it actually feels fairly natural, and you move on to secondary issues, like whether there's enough detail to see nuances of what the speaker's face is doing. If we look at the reasons for some of these delays, some of them are coming from the network protocol stacks and the speed of the network, but a large component of the delay comes from what kind of compression technology is used. Sometimes compression techniques are used which sacrifice delay in order to get better quality. Others do the compression on a frame-by-frame -frame basis to get the minimum amount of delay, sometimes sacrificing quality. Another source of delay comes from the video teleconferencing application itself. And finally, we can't forget distance. One of the facts of life is that New York and Los Angeles are about 30 milliseconds apart through fiber optic cable. That's the speed of light, and we currently don't have a solution to that problem. So, wide area video teleconferencing suffers an additional burden over local ones. High bandwidth networks not only reduce network delays, but also allow us to use different compression algorithms with lower delays. Another common use of video is often referred to as point to multipoint. This involves the use of broadcasting or multicasting of a video stream to multiple receivers at the same time. This isn't interactive like the video teleconferencing, and so delay is not as critical. However, in this case, the key issue instead of delay is quality. Once again, we benefit from high network bandwidth in that we can use higher quality compression algorithms. The next application question to ask is, how are we going to manage the access to all the information that's out there? One popular application which is often described is the concept of a personal digital newspaper. This employs a concept called network agents, which are programs to which you give the correct guidance for looking at the huge rivers of information flowing by and picking out items which are of interest to you. You might construct this to say, show me all the information on fiber optics. And every day, you'd get the news reports on that information that's been released on the wire to look at. Most of the publication industry is now looking at how they're going to make all their publications and stories available on the network. And so the amount to choose from is skyrocketing. Having intelligently designed agents that can go out there and put together something tailored for your use becomes even more valuable. Another aspect of this is browsing. Browsing is a concept which has been with us for a long time. For example, we're familiar with going off to the store to buy some milk and browsing through the store and finding 18 different items which you now realize you hadn't thought of in advance. We've also become familiar with network browsing through the use of Mosaic and the World Wide Web. These tools enable us to go out and sort through large volumes of information and without knowing exactly what we're looking for, find useful items. This becomes even more useful with high bandwidth networking. 
If you're looking for something, you would like to bring the whole page onto your screen, complete with all the graphics and perhaps video elements, and be able to just look at it quickly to determine whether you're interested. This requires the fire hose we talked about before, bringing lots of information onto the screen quickly. In today's World Wide Web, since the bandwidth is limited, sometimes you're not actually getting the information, but only an overview of the information, and then you're given perhaps an FTP pointer to the real information. It's almost more the model of the World Wide Web as a card catalog rather than the library for going browsing. But that will begin to evolve as bandwidth increases and our ability to flash pictures on the screen at a higher rate improves. An important area of research that's going on, in fact, is looking at navigation tools which help us to find things that we want using various different searching techniques that can be tailored to us as individuals. The desired result is to have help in looking at these huge flows of information to find what we want. Another important application area is network commerce. It's hard to find a trade publication these days that doesn't talk about the importance of doing business on the information superhighway or the national information infrastructure. However, there are some important technology issues which need to be solved for this to be practical. The first key issue is that of security. Security typically means three different areas. The first is authentication. Are you who you say you are? The second is access control. Are you allowed to get to this particular resource? And if so, what rights do you have? The third issue is privacy. Can someone looking over your network shoulder see what you're doing and read it? Privacy deals with areas such as encryption and other schemes for protecting your information. The second key technology issue is that of electronic money. The equivalent structure to that being provided today by credit cards and by banks. Checking credit, providing transaction tracking, arbitrating disputes, and tracing information so that you're confident that when you buy something, the money will make its way to the right place. That's not yet true of transactions over the network. A lot of companies are working on these issues. However, it's possible that this particular application area will be dominated more by business issues than it will be by technology issues. For example, how do you charge for information? In our store analogy, you walk around the store, look at items. It doesn't cost you to look at the items in the store. It's not until you want to take one away that you're charged for it. That model doesn't apply particularly well for databases the way they are built today. Once you've looked at the information, you've looked at it. So the question is, how do you charge for that? There are many approaches being tried today. We don't yet know the answer. Another key issue is how will people do advertising on the net? I'm really not looking forward to getting junk mail on my web pages every time I turn on Mosaic. So how are we going to address that big issue of content control? How do you regulate what's happening on the network? These issues are likely to dominate over the technology issues when it comes to network commerce. Before we look at how networks are built, let's take a brief look at some of the history of how they evolved. Back in the early 1970s, the first of the modern generation of computer networks was put together called the ARPANET. It was a store and forward packet switching network that was used to connect host computers together, time sharing systems for the most part, with terminals that were directly connected to the network. At that time, there were no LANs. The ARPANET itself was used to connect users and computers together. During the same time frame, some experiments were going on to build networks that use broadcast technologies both in the radio domain and in the broadcast satellite domain. The best known of these was the Aloha Network in Hawaii. These experiments demonstrated sharing a media, in this case it was radio or satellite bandwidth, 
but the same ideas and technologies were soon applied to a wire and from that came Ethernet technology and the other shared media lands. Ethernet, of course, took off very rapidly and with the advent of PCs and workstations, LANs grew to be the preferred way for interconnecting devices. However, we soon had islands of LANs, and these islands were interconnected first with bridges, which made it one big network, and following that, routers, which gave you administrative capabilities for controlling the huge growth of these networks, which brings us from an architectural point of view to where we are today. Now let's take a look at some of the key technology issues and the trade-offs that one has to face in choosing a network technology. The first one we'll look at is the issue of shared media versus switching technologies. This diagram illustrates a shared media network as a single domain, whether it's a wire or it's a broadcast environment. In this case, traffic is shown from four sources, all mixed on the same wire. The total aggregate bandwidth is, in the case of Ethernet, 10 megabits per second. However, each station will only get its proportional share. Here we see a switching network. Switching networks have been around for a long time. The telephone network is a huge example of a switch network built around circuits. On the premises, the PBX, or your local telephone switch, are examples of boxes which provide switching. The key to this technology is that the bandwidth inside the box is very large compared to one of the lines coming in. In the case of a switched Ethernet environment, all the lines going into the box are 10 megabits per second, whereas the aggregate bandwidth available inside the box might be multiple gigabits. In the example shown, the path carrying information from station A sees no interference from line B or line C. Everyone gets a full 10 megabits per second through that switch. And so, although in both cases you've got 10 megabit lines coming into it, in the case of the switched network, the amount of bandwidth that the user sees can be tremendously larger. The key to applying switching in the LAN context was building a box that had sustainable multiple gigabits of throughput. Recent technology now allows that, and thus all the commotion about moving to switched Ethernet because that technology is now there to make it be possible. The next item to consider is datagram versus virtual circuits versus circuits. This illustrates a datagram network. Datagrams can be modeled as a post office in that each packet coming in has got a full, complete address on it and is routed through the network based on the address. So, in theory, Different packets on the same conversation might actually take different paths through the network, although there's usually a single optimal path and all the packets will flow down it. But each one does have its full address so they can make their way independently. Some implications are that you have some extra robustness, you have no setup time, if you send a packet independently from any others into the network, it will make its way out to the destination. On the other hand, it is somewhat CPU intensive because each address is a global address and the switch has to resolve that address for each packet going through the network. This takes more processing power and as a result, for the same amount of CPU, a switch will have a smaller datagram capacity than with virtual circuits. This illustrates a virtual circuit, in particular an ATM circuit where the model here, unlike the post office, is that of the telephone network. You spend some time up front dialing and getting the correct end-to-end -end circuit established, but then each packet going down the line need only have the name of the circuit it's going on, which is a very small address. It's not a global address, so the switch doesn't need to have a complex resolution algorithm to figure out which circuit it is dealing with. It's a straightforward algorithm. If it comes in on, in this case, line one, put it out on line three. So it's a small address database and easy for the CPU to handle. So with the same amount of silicon, you can build a hardware-based switching which will handle a lot more traffic. 
With a datagram approach versus a virtual circuit approach, there isn't one way that is better than the other. There are different techniques for doing switching. Which brings us to the issue of transmitting frames versus transmitting cells. When you're sending a packet of information, the common terminology is that if the packet is of a variable length, it's called a frame. When it's a fixed length packet, it's called a cell. And cells are usually small. Frames have an advantage from the point of view of overhead because for one header, you can put quite a lot of data behind it. So percentage-wise, the overhead of the header is amortized over a much larger amount of data. On the other hand, because it's variable-sized, the receiving switch has to look inside the packet, find out the length, allocate variable buffer size, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's more work that has to be done than with cells. Cells, on the other hand, have a header on each one of the much smaller data packets and therefore, percentage-wise, have a lot more overhead. But they can be processed in hardware because they're all the same fixed size and because cells tend to be used in the virtual circuit environment, they have very simple addressing scheme and require much less CPU processing. Once again, this isn't a case where one is right and the other isn't. However, there is one very interesting aspect of frames versus cells, and that has to do with jitter. Jitter is the term that's used for variability in the inter-arrival gap between packets. If you're sending a stream of packets and the time between the packets is identical in each case, then there is perceived to be no jitter. Whereas if there are variable delays, that variability is called jitter. This can have a big effect when you're sending isochronous type traffic. Let's use video as an example. In the case of a video player, if you're doing, say, 30 frames per second, every 30th of a second, the system wants to put out the next frame. If it hasn't arrived yet, then you're in trouble. And so, typically, what a system will do is repeat the previous frame. This is what makes the jerky motion when you're looking at a video teleconference. It's even worse for audio, because in the case of audio, when you're ready to send the next piece of information out to the speaker, if you don't have it, you can't repeat the last soundbite. You have to send silence, and then you get dropout. In a packet switching system, jitter is typically caused by different types of queuing delays. For example, if you are a voice packet and you're queued up behind a very large data packet, you have to sit there while that data packet is being transmitted you might have to wait a very long time. If you have very small cells, this enables you to manage the buffering and manage the queuing in order to reduce the jitter. ATM, which uses cells and therefore has the potential to be better at this jitter problem, has gotten a reputation for being the preferred media for sending video and voice type information. Whereas if you're sending a lot of data over the network, then overhead gets to be the bigger issue. If you're sending a computer program, jitter is not an issue. You just need to get it all there correctly in an acceptable amount of time. In that case, frames may be a better approach. Once again, there's a trade-off here. This piece of the technology puzzle has to do with how bandwidth is utilized inside a switch whether when a packet comes in, it's handled on a best efforts basis, or whether some of the total bandwidth is reserved for that packet. This picture illustrates the ATM world with two types of traffic coming through. If you look at the lower traffic going through, it has reserved bandwidth for it. The system tries to schedule the buffer space and resources so it is always able to handle the reserved amount of traffic for this particular virtual circuit. This is very useful when you're sending long, steady things like video or audio, which will continue to send a certain amount of information. The upper part of the picture reflects more typical LAN data, which is very bursty in nature. You're never sure exactly when information is coming, but if you've got the information coming, you'd like to use all the buffering that's available. And if there aren't resources available, you're willing to wait, because jitter isn't an issue. The total bandwidth is the issue. 
In the ATM world, that technology is called available bit rate. The notion is, give me everything you've got, and if I haven't got it, I'll wait. Now, of course, the I'll wait part implies that you have some feedback mechanism and are not just simply throwing the packets on the floor. There is a challenge in building this technology, especially if the network doesn't have flow control mechanisms that have a stop-start type system. This next issue asks the question, which protocol layer are you looking at in order to make your switching decision? In the case of routers, they're actually looking at the higher level protocols to make that decision. With IP packets, you look at the IP field to figure out where things are going. For other protocols, you look at the right field for that protocol. You must figure out first which protocol it is to tell you where to look, and then that tells you how to route the packet. Layer two, the MAC layer, is simpler. For example, in an Ethernet environment, you just look at the Ethernet MAC address, and that tells you where to route things. In a layer one switch, which is a physical layer switch, you are typically switching virtual circuits, and in that case, you really don't care what protocols are sent, just which VC it is. ATM is an excellent example of a layer one protocol. All three of these things have been implemented, and they all have their place, and it's once again a trade-off depending on the traffic type. If we look at today's internet and use the terminology we just went through, the network typically consists of shared media LANs, interconnected with layer three protocol dependent datagram based switches. They're called routers. When these networks are configured with three tiers, there is the workgroup LAN, an ethernet or a token ring, and those are connected within the campus with a backbone or campus network, sometimes with FDDI, more frequently now with a more modern technology like ATM. And then these campuses are interconnected with a WAN backbone of one kind or another. Now let's step back and ask the question, what do we want from our network? Well, we want access to a large amount of information from all over the network. We want our normal file, print, and mail services. And increasingly, we want more real-time traffic which includes video and other isochronous type information. So, now let's look at two ways in which you can construct a network to accomplish this. We'll call the first one the internet approach. I call it that because it's sort of the way the internet is built today. And we think of that as desktops and LANs connected through routers, and the routers are connected together either through LANs, through wide area technologies, or through other routers and dedicated circuits, creating a layer three network. This is the common way things are built today. One of the knocks is that it's hard to manage if it gets very large and doesn't do such a good job with isochronous traffic like video. However, the technology is continuing to evolve. New technologies and new protocols are being implemented in routers to give you better administration capabilities. Protocols like Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which allow automatic addressing so that when you plug your workstation into the network, your workstation is issued an IP address rather than having to pre-configure one. Bandwidth reservation protocols are being added into the routers. Protocols like RSVP, which implement IP flows. This adds to the router the ability to establish a virtual circuit through the router network. So if you had video traffic that needed half a megabit of bandwidth, you could set up an IP flow which would reserve that half megabit of bandwidth through the network. The net result would be low jitter and the ability to do video over routers. With new addressing in the next generation of the IP protocol, and with faster processors going into the routers, you'll be able to scale them up to handle lots more addresses, lots more LANs, and larger networks. An alternate to this would be building an all-switching network. This example shows switch LANs. Perhaps they're switch Ethernet, or perhaps they're ATM to the desktop. In either case, they're interconnected with switching WANs, most likely ATM. An advantage of this approach is that when you set up a virtual circuit from the workstation through to the server, it is one long end-to-end -end circuit with low jitter and low overhead. 
If you've asked for a particular class of service, like low delay or high priority, that's maintained through the whole network. In this all switching case, because it's virtual circuit based like a PBX, administration is much simpler. Also, many of the switch vendors are implementing what are called VLANs or virtual LANs through the network. A virtual LAN provides the ability to group particular addresses together to look like what a LAN segment looks like today. You might have several addresses in a workgroup and you can send messages that go to everyone in that workgroup but only in that workgroup. It's a way to simplify administration. It's also a way to simplify problem solving in a network. Imagine a large switch network which is divided into a dozen virtual LANs, if you will, and you have one device which is a network analyzer. You could, in sequence, instruct the network to connect that analyzer to each of the virtual LANs instead of having a dozen analyzers. You could have a single analyzer and from one station configure it to be part of each VLAN. Also, because the switching can be done at layer one, these types of networks are also protocol independent. With switch networks that are VC based, like ATM, the network learns a great deal about the nature of the circuit during the call setup phase. This allows the network to have an easier time of building reserve bandwidth and in the case of ATM, you also get the advantage of low jitter and lower delays. Implementing available bitrate for the LAN data gets the most efficiency through the switch. Also, because ATM switching systems are implemented in hardware, they scale very easily, allowing large networks to be built. This is an example of what a switch system might look like where you have switched Ethernet hubs connecting some of the workstations together. Other workstations are connected directly through to the ATM backbone, and the ATM backbone provides switch interconnection between the systems. This allows you to gracefully move more and more stations directly onto ATM if necessary, although since the Ethernet still has many advantages, we can safely predict that Ethernet will continue to enjoy a long and healthy life as a networking technology. We've seen that both Ethernet and ATM as technologies allow us to build large networks and allow interconnecting of LANs. Ethernet's been around a long time and people understand it very well. What are the challenges that are posed for ATM networks? Well, we talked about the available bit rate and that's certainly a challenge because as we mentioned, you'd like to be able to get all the available bandwidth for non-time critical information but the flow control mechanisms currently being debated in the standards bodies for ATM are more rate-based and don't have good stop and start mechanisms. Development of effective ABR mechanisms is going to be very challenging for the ATM switch vendors. That's one of the important things to look for. As we mentioned, the ATM flow control mechanisms are rate-based and designed such that if your switch is getting full, you squeeze incoming streams a little so that you don't overflow your buffers. This counts on having somewhat constant streams coming into the switch. The ability to take bursty data, like LAN data, and put it into a nicely shaped flow is called traffic shaping. Here the laws of large numbers help you. If you have lots and lots of LANs and you're aggregating them together, then you have a relatively smooth flow and you can deal with that. If you have smaller pipes, you tend not to be able to fit as many different sources of traffic into them and traffic shaping becomes more difficult. A third challenge has to do with implementing connectionless or datagram services over a network which is inherently circuit based. You certainly wouldn't want to have to set up a circuit, go through all the call setup procedures for each packet. Rather, you'd like to have some mechanism which was a much lighter weight approach for doing datagrams. Fourthly, how do you integrate the switching technologies with layer three routing technology? For example, if you built these virtual LANs as we've described, and you want to communicate between virtual LANs, do you ask the user to put an external router on the network so all the traffic goes outside the switch, through the router, and back in? Or, 
do you take the router and make it into a virtual router and spread it over all the switches? If you do that, how do you ensure the firewall and security mechanisms that we've come to depend on in our routers? That's a challenge. And finally, of course, there's much debate about what's the right data rate for ATM. Is it 155? Is that overkill for the desktop? Is 25 megabits the right number for desktops? What about servers? Should they go up to 622? There are still some significant challenges yet ahead to be solved for ATM. If we consider these challenges in light of where technology is today, here's what I am forecasting for the world of ATM. ATM is likely to be very good for the bandwidth providers. If you've got lots of bandwidth, then some of these complicated issues about flow control and how you deal with bursty streams are much easier. The phone companies and other bandwidth providers should be embracing ATM sooner rather than later because it will be easier for them and gives them the benefits of statistical multiplexing. Also, we've seen that ATM, because it is cell-based, is better for those situations where low jitter traffic, like video, is required. So if the reason for deploying a network was to put in a video network, ATM would likely be a better choice for that. The third point is that routers are getting bandwidth management capabilities of their own. It is not likely that ATM switches will rapidly replace routers because routers are, if you will, fighting back and offering the same kinds of technologies, the same kind of benefits to the user, and so we should see the internet approach as well as the ATM switch approach will both continue to be viable options for LAN interconnection. However, if you already see a need for very high bandwidths, like 622 megabits per second, this has been standardized in the ATM domain and is currently out of the reach of today's Ethernet networks. So if you really need high bandwidth, ATM will once again be a preferable technology. And finally, since ATM is a layer one switching implementation, if you're supporting many different kinds of protocols and really need to stay independent of the protocols, then ATM will work well in that situation. As we've looked at these different technologies, what we've seen is that the bandwidth available for network computing is likely to be going up dramatically in the near future as these technologies get deployed. This will enable a whole new set of applications in the network computing domain to come into existence and should provide exciting new opportunities for the user. I'm personally very excited about these recent developments in high bandwidth networking. I hope that you have gotten something out of this presentation and perhaps caught some of my enthusiasm. Thank you.